Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. Jay Prone is a journalist specialising in plants and gardening. Jane is regularly published in The Guardian, The Financial Times, Gardens Illustrated and The Garden Design Journal. Jane's hugely popular podcast, On the Ledge, covers the world of houseplants, from cacti to succulents to terrariums and ferns. We're absolutely delighted to welcome Jane to our Dig It podcast today. Hello, Jane, and welcome to Dig It. Where do we find you today? Uh, you find me in my office. Um, it's all a bit chaotic here because we're having our bathroom done. So I've just had to say to the builder, please don't disturb us for <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> oh, lovely. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm so... sequestered in the garden office. <laughs> that sounds really good. And a, a chilly, chilly morning as well in, uh, as, we, as we go into the month of December. So the world of houseplants, perhaps you can perhaps sort of set the scene for our, uh, our listeners and tell us a little, about, a little bit about your journey into the potted plant world. Well, it's really been a lifelong fascination, and I can't really remember a time when I wasn't growing indoor plants. From a very young age, I was collecting them and buying them with my pocket money and enjoying them, really. And it's something that's just continued from there. Um, I guess some people tend to get into gardening and plants when they get their first house, but that wasn't the case for me. As I say, I started off life interested in this stuff, and I do have, my dad was a keen gardener as was my uh, one of my granddads so maybe I got the DNA from them <laughs> but I just really enjoyed growing stuff from a young age and has continued on so yeah I'm feeling kind of uh, happy right now that everyone else has kind of caught on to this thing that for many years was <laughs> seen as a bit of an oddity to be interested in houseplants. J- Jane can I just ask you can, can you remember the first sort of houseplant you, you you grew from going back to the your, your early years? Well, I can't remember the exact first thing. I do have very clear memories of being, I must have been only about five, well, maybe about between about five or six and having cacti that I think I must have got from jumble sales or something like that. I can't, or I've been given them. I can't think that they were something I spent a lot of money on. And I remember I had this particular one and I think it was probably some kind of echinopsis. Mm-hmm. And it flowered, and my mind was just completely blown because oh, yeah. I just had no idea that this cactus was going to produce this incredible, amazing-looking flower. Um, and I was, you know, as quite a young child, that was fascinating to me. And I was also quite lucky because at my middle school, we had um, a greenhouse which was full of cacti. So oh. I was able to sort of, you know, experience that at school. So I was very, very lucky to have that opportunity. And you know, got taken to the garden centre regularly with my dad and got given plants. And I ended up with, you know, quite a collection as a young child. And I've got a few pictures of me. I'm probably a bit older here. I'm probably about 11 or 12 with lots of my plants. And, yeah, it, mm. it's been something I've been just interested in forever. So it's hard to sort of pinpoint, oh, but this was my first plant um, because it goes back yeah. further than my memory, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so... On the basis of that, then, how did the On The Ledge podcast evolve? Well, I mean, I guess I'm very, very lucky in that my passion, my hobby, has become my job. So I started out life wanting to be a journalist, um, never really thought of going into horticulture. That wasn't really something that crossed my mind. Uh, but I really wanted to be a journalist ever since I saw my name in the I got my first byline in the school magazine at primary school for like a two line review of a theatre trip and I was like I love this so I wanted to be a journalist so I went into journalism and I was in news journalism for quite a few years and I worked at the Guardian um and at that point uh yeah I did my houseplants were my hobby and then once I'd had my first child and had a maternity leave I was kind of a bit jaded by the the news cycle I mean the early 2000s were I don't know if you recall but were Mm. quite a busy news period (laughs) with things like the Iraq war and 9-11 and I was really burnt out so I the job of gardening editor at the Guardian came up while I was on maternity leave and I thought oh this would be how lovely would that be Mm. so I became gardening editor and then ended up doing a podcast with the Guardian with my colleague Alice Fowler um, and which was I love doing that. 
Mm. Uh, but that was a general gardening podcast. And then that ended and the Guardian didn't want to do any more of that. So I thought, gosh, I love podcasts. I love houseplants. Let's combine the whole thing together. So that's how in February 2017, the podcast began. And uh, yeah, it's been almost five years um, since then. So yeah, it's, gosh. Uh, it's been, I mean, I guess the other thing to say is that the reason why I chose houseplants specifically rather than gardening in general was that A, they were my personal passion. B, mm. I could see in February 2017 that they really were becoming mm. more popular. They were on an uptick. And I just thought, gosh, I want to capitalize on that and tell people stuff that they weren't really reading in the regular garden media because houseplants really at that point just were not being written about in any you know consistent mm. way they were just occasionally mentioned on the pages of the gardening magazine when it came to christmas but they weren't being treated as seriously as i wanted them to be treated so that's where the podcast came from that's great so, so i mean i have listened to a, a number of your uh, your podcast jane uh, over, over the last few weeks and um, you do speak to some amazing houseplant experts or probably people who are really really passionate as you say do you have any sort of memorable moments from, from those sort of podcasts you've done? Anything particularly which sort of stands out to, uh, to, to enlighten us with? Well, one, one episode that lots of listeners mention when they talk about their favourite episodes is an episode I did where I went to visit Abbey Brook Cactus Nursery in the Peak District to look at the lithops there, the stone plants. And the owner there, Brian Fern, who's an incredible guy, a lithops expert, um, sadly now um, quite elderly and his sight's going but he was just an absolute delight to talk to and so knowledgeable and it was such a fun episode and the funniest thing was when I asked him about pests on lithops and his immediate fireback response was baboons which <laughs> really made me laugh and obviously that is true that in habitat baboons do eat lithops but it just was so funny um, and he was a real character so that was a, a, a lovely trip and um, I just, yeah, I have very fond memories of that. And lots of listeners love that particular episode. And um, it was just so joyous to share his passion for those plants. And uh, what else is there? Well, the other episode that really stands out as being kind of a watershed moment on the show was when I went to James Wong's place and did um, a couple of episodes talking to him about his house plants. And he was so generous with his time and we had such fun talking about house plants and seeing his amazing collection. And lots of listeners still love those episodes. So those were two particularly special ones. Oh, they sound great. Yes. Uh, and so James is quite a good friend of the Garden Centre here. He came about four or five years ago and we had a, a sort of special uh, sort of celebrity gardener weekend. And uh, James was very popular with our with our customers. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, such a he nice has he has a certain he has a certain epic cachet, cachet amongst the, the middle aged ladies. I mean, I speak as a middle aged lady. <laughs> <laughs> they love James. He's he's an absolute star. But also in the last few years, you know, he's done this amazing thing for houseplants in terms of you know really popularizing mm. things that were before seen as quite um, well very very niche, like mm. doing. Uh, terrariums with water in them and really exciting kind of aquascaping projects so he's yeah he's really leading the way that's great no it's good good to hear um so um what would be your sort of philosophy for our for our listeners who you know are maybe taking their first tentative steps into to selecting houseplants for their home what what sort of uh, what would be your philosophy in in selecting those those uh, lovely green and, and flowering plants well i think the place to start is by looking around at what spaces you've got and the main way that people kill houseplants is really light um, i know people say over watering and they're kind of intimately connected really but you know you've got to look for places in your home where you have a good amount of light and it really depends on what kind of house you've got but you know look for your biggest windows and think about what space you've got think about how whether that's a heated space or an unheated space sometimes unheated spaces are actually um, more useful than heated spaces mm -hmm. for certain plants so think about temperature and light and also what makes you get excited so there's no point buying a plant just because it's perfect for your house if actually it doesn't make you get excited Very true. so factor in all these things and when you go to the garden center 
you know, try and do your research. Ask the staff, you know, you can Google stuff as well. You know, use, use every resource that you can find to choose plants carefully because, you know, plants are a resource. And so we should be choosing them carefully because then we have the best chance of helping them thrive and, and make really long term residents in our houses. Mm, yeah, I totally agree. Um, on, on that basis, then, uh, a piece of advice then, perhaps for somebody who is thinking about growing houseplants for the first time, maybe a slightly different track. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's, a, you know, it's very easy to um, go to the supermarket and you, you're doing your weekly shop and you see a lovely plant, you think, oh, yes, I'll pick that up. Um, and it's not always useful when those plants are just labelled foliage plant. Um, the more you can observe about your plant, the more you will learn. Um, you know, aside from, you know, looking up the, the name of the plant, you can also just look at the plant and tell a lot from it. And that will guide you in terms of how to care for it. Put new plants that you're, that you're concerned about somewhere where you're going to see them. They're in your eye line on a daily basis. There's a big trend towards, you know, putting plants on high shelves and having them hanging. But the trouble with that is it's hard to see what's going on. If you've got your plant, you know, where you do the washing up or on your desk or somewhere where you're looking at them regularly, your spot changes really quickly. And that's really important when it comes to things like watering and pests arriving. You're going to spot those problems and be able to nip them in the bud rather than things going seriously wrong and then you're <laughs> in trouble. <laughs> Indeed. And, and would you, Jane, sort of think about having a conversation with your house plants? I mean, Prince Charles is reportedly to have, have uh, <laughs> had that. I took say, although he has, he has been sort of denied, hasn't it? But uh, what, what, do you, what do you think about having a, a quick tete a tete with your, your Tradescantia? Well, I'm more of the mind of swearing at aphids than talking to my housewives, to be quite honest. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I don't really, I, I know lots of, particularly younger people with houseplants give them names. I mean, my daughter's got into houseplants recently and she gives them names. That's not kind of how I work as a, as a houseplant grower, but that's the great thing is that you can choose how you want to do houseplants. And if you want to talk to them, it's certainly not going to do them any harm. It's going to mean that you're spending more time with them and you're going to spot things that are going wrong more quickly and observe them better. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with talking to your houseplants. And, you know, I know that during the past year and a half during the pandemic that mm. lots of people have found houseplants an incredible outlet yeah. and resource for, for just sheer joy. So, yeah. yeah, if you want to talk to your houseplants, go ahead. That's absolutely fine. That's great. Good advice, Jane. I, I quite agree. And they actually probably get the extra carbon dioxide as well, which probably doesn't do them any, any harm as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, on, we, we were saying about, obviously, advice on, on plants, but watering, goodness me, watering is such a, can be such a pitfall for, for people. So some basic tips on, on watering a house plants? Yeah, I mean, if you go online, there are a million and one tips. So you mustn't do this, you must do that, that. And really, what it boils down to is two things. It boils down to really not how much water you're giving, but what substrate your plants are in, what the potting mix is like. So, you know, if you bought a cactus and you haven't repotted it, unfortunately, often cacti are sold in substrates that work brilliantly in the computer controlled environment of the nursery, but not in your home. If you haven't repotted that cactus and you are watering it, um, in a way that means that that soil isn't getting a chance to dry out properly, then you've probably killed that cactus via rot. But if you have reposted it in a really good free draining cactus and succulent compost, you could water the same amount and your plant will be absolutely fine. So roots need uh, air as well as water. And there are certain species that particularly really don't like to have wet roots. So provided that substrate correct, you can actually oftentimes you know, water fairly generously. The second point, though, is where does the water go? So does your pot have holes in the bottom? And when you're watering, are you leaving the plant in an outer cash pot or in a tray where that water's collecting and then stagnating and then denying the plant air to the roots? So those are two things to think about. And it doesn't really matter how you do it, whether you, you know, take them out and plunge them into a bucket of water or whether you water with a watering can, there are 
pluses and minuses to, to those both of those techniques. But just make sure that you're observing your plant before you water. Mm. So rather than just going, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's Sunday at 2 p.m. I must water all my plants. Before you do anything, don't be on a schedule. Rather, look at your plant, observe it, probably stick your finger into the soil and check that the soil actually needs watering before you go ahead and do it. And that way um, you'll get to know your house plants better and you'll also prevent disasters of overwatering. Mm, I do one, one sort of tip yeah certainly you, the, the weight of a pot as well isn't it once you have given a plant a really good good soak and it's drained and you've perhaps pop, popped it back in its pot cover sometimes the the weight is sometimes a good indication on yeah. some plants as well isn't it absolutely and you know you get to know as you get to know your plant better you will know you know if something's in a terracotta pot obviously the weight's going to be different but you'll mm. get to know over time how it feels when it's wet and how it feels when it's dry and that can really help you as well um you can stick um you know you can buy these moisture meters which some of which are okay the cheap ones are, are don't last very long and it's not always accurate depending on what substrate you're using but you can if you don't like sticking your finger in a pot you can just get an old uh, or a wooden lolly stick stick that in for half an hour and see how it comes out is it coming out damp or dry and that will give you a good idea of what's happening at the root level as opposed to the top because the top can be completely dry, but actually there's plenty of moisture around the roots. So mm. anything you can do to give a, um, a good guide of how moist your roots are really does help um, and can get you out of a lot of, a, a lot of problems before they start. Uh, great, great tips there, Jane. Thank you. Um, we've got quite a number of, of Dracaenas uh, in our offices at, at the garden centre. And uh, why is it, uh, often the, there's a problem where the, the tips of the, the leaves go brown. And obviously sometimes you get a bit of a, a colour change as well um, within usually the green Dracaenas. Is there any sort of reasons for that in, in your, uh, your, your, your opinion? Yeah, they do. That is a problem that does occur with lots of those kind of dracaenas and also cordylines and it's really because they've got that really pointy I and mean, i'm just looking over at my my dracaena sitting near me so it's a very very pointy leaf tip and so that's quite vulnerable to any problems any problems the plant is experiencing in its conditions will be expressed through the end of that leaf just dying off slightly there are quite a few different reasons why it can happen uh the, the one that people don't think about usually is the fact that Dracaenas as a genus are sensitive to chlorine in the water. So if you water with tap water, they'll be fine. I mean, you're just going to have a few dry tips, but that can cause that problem of brown tips. So um, the answer there is to water with rainwater or um, distilled water. You, It doesn't work anymore to just leave water, tap water sitting out because of kind of uh, chlorine that's put in now doesn't actually evaporate like I, I can't remember the exact science but there's basically mm -hmm. that doesn't work anymore you can't just leave a, a pot of water out for 24 hours and right. the chlorine will be gone so you need to use rain I, I use rainwater on all my plants if you've got a water butt just go for it because it's it's free <laughs> and it works yeah. very nicely so yeah water with rainwater and then it's just c cultural things like you know too much water can cause it um, dry air can cause it uh, so just try to give your plants their best life, really. But I I don't worry too much about brown tips. Like, it, it happens. If you really want to, you can cut them off. But usually it's not a major problem. The trouble with Dracaena is that they're so easy that people really just think they can neglect them completely. Whereas if you actually look after your Dracaena, they are beautiful plants. The, the colour change thing, oftentimes, again, people forget to feed. So... Yes, a Dracaena will survive for a really long time without any feeding, but it will look so much better if you do feed it when it's in active growth. So some foliar houseplant feed is ideal uh, and just don't let it be bleached by sitting in direct sunlight because it probably won't like that either. Uh, uh, very good, good, good points. Um, on the, I mean, green cedars are probably a good example of this, but what about uh, cleaning, dusting, polishing your, your houseplant leaves? Sort of any any tips uh, on cleaning without perhaps you resort without resorting the houseplant wipes so on leaf shine i think there is <laughs> there's lots of bad advice out there about you know using household products to shine leaves such as mayo and coconut oil and olive oil 
milk and beer. Don't do any of that, is my advice. None of it is going to help your plants to be more shiny, and it's probably going to block their stomata as well, the, the, the plant's breathing pores. He said you just need to use a damp cloth. Um, ideally, if you live in a hard water area, use rainwater or distilled water to dampen that cloth. You know, I just use old T-shirts torn up because they're nice and soft. And just carefully remove the dust from the leaves with that cloth. That's all you need to do. If you've got plants with particularly delicate leaves or ones that you can't really uh, clean like that, you can also, you know, in the summer, put them outside when it's raining and let the rainwater naturally wash them you can also put them in the shower if you want to you know there are different ways of doing it but it, it should always be quite free and literally free and easy to, to get your house plants dust free you know don't expect uh, that your house plant leaves are going to be like a looking glass because that's just not natural there aren't really house plants that have leaves like that so um, well, i think we get a full sense of what leaves should look like but yeah healthy leaves should be dust free and that will help the plant to sort of grow its best. Mm, yeah, I, I quite agree. I think um, we can go a bit overzealous on the on the leaf shine sometimes, and it can look quite, in a way, quite artificial. It can bring a false sense of mm. uh, of, uh, of of colour to the leaves. I don't know, but uh, it's uh, it's good. On on the subject of um, of feeding plants, now obviously um, Baby Bio obviously will give it a plug because it is probably the most well known houseplant feed. It's been around for since the nineteen fifties, early sixties, if memory serves me correctly. Um, obviously, there's a plethora of specialist feeds out there. What's your your take on on feeding your your indoor plants? Well, I mean, my my main thing is just remember to do it because so many people <laughs> don't bother feeding house plants ever. And I mean, I can understand why you can get away with that for a long time because, you know, most houseplants potting mix will contain some nutrients. And so a new plant that you've got from the garden centre or um, a plant that you've repotted yourself will, will go for quite a while on those nutrients. But when the plant's in active growth and when it hasn't been repotted for a few months, it does need more nutrients. It can't search into the soil with its roots to find more nutrients. It's reliant on you. So if you can feed your plants, it doesn't really matter what you use as long as it's, um, I, usually the distinction is between foliage and flowers, mm -hmm. getting a slightly different nutrient profile. There are a few plants that really do benefit from a different kind of feed. Cacti and succulents um, have quite low nutrient needs um, and orchids as well. So you can buy specialist feeds for those. But you, know, you can buy specialist feeds for very, very specific plants, really, you just need to distinguish between foliage and flowers and find one that works for you that's easy to apply. And my other rule is uh, weekly, weekly, as in every week and diluted. And I should add another caveat to that, when they're in active growth. So if you've got plants, for example, like cacti and succulents that at this time of year should be having a cool, dry rest, they don't want feeding right now. But if the plant's growing actively, then use the houseplant fertilizer you have, but maybe use it with every watering just at a diluted rate. And that will hopefully keep your houseplants ticking over with feed. And yeah, you should get good results. Mm. I mean, I mean, the other area, I suppose, is especially with sort of foliage plant is misting. Um, does it really work, or is it is it better perhaps to grow more uh, susceptible plants? I'm thinking things like your little adiantum ferns and uh, sort of the I don't know, peperomias pileas in a, in a terrarium or a very humid little uh, greenhouse. Um, what, what's what's our thoughts yeah, on I those? Mean, humidity. I mean, I remember Monty Don saying on the garden as well that he misted his you know maidenhair phone six times a day and i'm thinking gosh you know monty give yourself a break that's just like so much work and plus missing you have really would have to do it that many times a day for it to make any real difference to the hu air humidity around the plant there are much better ways to deal with plants that like moist air really and you know sometimes having water constantly on the leaves isn't a good idea either so you know things like grouping plants together Mm -hmm. helps to create a microclimate sitting them on a tray with some pebbles in it covered just under the surface of the pebbles with water that sort of allows water to evaporate and increase uh, the air the air humidity around those plants 
And oftentimes with things like ferns, if you can provide steady moisture at root level, they can cope with lower humidity than you might think. So I tend to, for ferns, I would tend to have some kind of wick watering or self-watering set up where you've got a container. I mean, you can buy a self-watering pot. It does make life easy, but you can make these yourself. Just having a reservoir below, perhaps filled with something like expanded clay pebbles with water in there, and then a wick running up into the pot. And that way the plant just draws up what it needs. And it does mean that they can cope with lower humidity in the air than if you are just watering them in the normal way and allowing them to dry out between waterings. So there's a few things you can do. The other thing is just put plants where the air is naturally more humid, like the bathroom or the kitchen. Um, and yes, of course, things like glass cloches and terrariums can be used for plants that really do need um, higher humidity. And my only caveat to that would be, please, please don't put succulents and cacti in terrariums because it offends my eye and it, it's <laughs> yes. really not it's a not right. good thing to do and i no. see it everywhere and it's really popular and it can i mean it can work for a short mm. amount of time but ultimately it's yeah. just not where they want to be <laughs> not naturally so, in, a, yeah. in a glass container and the, i was gonna say the other thing james certainly with, when i'm misting my house plants at home i make sure the mist is in the in the room at, and the water is at sort of room temperature so i don't uh, i don't shock them yeah, with the cold exactly. tap <laughs> maybe in the in the summer yeah, i can probably get away <laughs> yeah and that's true with water as well you know i i uh water i fill up my my i have a milkman and so i have glass milk bottles and, and i just i when they're empty i just take them out to the water but fill them up and bring them indoors get them to room temperature and then water from that um, mm. and same with misting and the only time i really use a mister is when i have um a pest infestation um, and then I will apply um, a, a treatment with um, with the mister. So some plants do get get misted for that reason. But yeah, other than that, it's just too much work misting. Yeah. I mean, I, if you've got plenty of time on your hands, it's kind of mindful, isn't it? It's a nice thing to do, mm. wafting around with your mister. But um, <laughs> very therapeutic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, this is an interesting question. Um, are there any house plants that really do well uh, that we often? often find perhaps less scrupulous um, retailers um, might be selling which we're perhaps best avoiding houseplants which which, which we see which <laughs> that's a really good question well there's a number of different ways to tackle this question I mean one person's easy plant is another person's diva so it's very hard to generalize what I would say is you know a lot of the Maranta group plants like the the Calatheas, or they've now been reassigned as Gapertias, and the Tenanthes and the Stromants and the Marantas, these beautiful foliage plants, they're so popular and they're just, you know, there's just hundreds of them in the, you know, DIY sheds and supermarkets and garden centres, and people love them. They're not the easiest thing to get right. So if you're starting out, possibly don't be beguiled by that beautiful foliage. Try something else that's a little bit easier first. Um, some people do really well with them, but some people just find them a mass of spider mite within a few weeks and they just turn brown and crispy. So that's one one thing. With um, The other thing I would say, we need to be very aware now of um, poaching. And this happens not really with people going to garden centres, but people buying online. Um, and any cordisiform plant, or I shouldn't say any, a lot of cordisiform plants, that just means the ones that have got fat, woody bases on them. Um, there's a number of these being sold. Uh, oftentimes, these plants are being taken from wild from habitat. So be very, very cautious about buying from sort of random people on the internet. These plants uh, may well have been taken from the wild. It's much better to go via um, an expert seller um, and ask the questions about where the plants come from. Uh, I mean, the other one that people really routinely kill is, as I was just saying, the, the maidenhair fern. You know, they're very widely available. People buy them and very quickly kill them. Um, if you do what I just suggested with the watering, self-watering system, they're actually not too bad and they will revive even if they crisp up completely. But lots of people do kill those. So that's not a 
necessarily a first time as plant. But as I say, you know, the funniest thing is you'll go to somebody's house and be like, how are you growing that plant? And they'll be just like, oh, well, I, I don't know. I just, it's, I don't even know what it is. I just, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, plants that I kill, other people do well with. So it's very hard to generalize. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you put, you just, just try to go for a plant that, um, sort of suits your conditions and uh, maybe also go by somebody suggested this to me the other day and I've never thought of it but it's a good tip see if you've got house planting neighbours what are they growing and if it grows in their house then it probably will grow in your house because you've probably got the same kind of windows and heating system and so on. Mm, well, that sounds like a really good tip. Yeah, good good opportunity to have a chat with the neighbours as well. I mean, the only plants I was thinking, <laughs> which is sort of sold, um, is, the, is it the cocos? Is it the cocos palm, the one which produces the... Oh, when, when, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that produces that amazing big sort of fronds, uh, amazing sort of palm-like sort of structure from the, mm. the big nut and... I mean, I've I've tried I have to say I've tried a number of times over the years, and yeah, um, yeah I think it, if you buy them during the summer, you've got a bit of a chance. But if you buy them at this time of the year, I think you're really up against yeah. the, the wall there. But uh, miss spraying with that was was essential to keep it going as long as it, as I did, perhaps. But uh, yeah, good, it's a good one. Okay. Um, well, what people don't what people don't realise is that you know there are different classifications of house plants. Some house plants are it's assumed that you are going to have for it. they're what's called, really called pot plants in that they're going to be in your house a bit like an extended bouquet really mm-hmm. and they're not going to last forever mm-hmm. um so you know lots of people ask me after christmas oh how can i keep my poinsettia alive you can't throw it away put it in a compost <laughs> i mean i hate poinsettia so i'm going to be i'm going to be negative about them but <laughs> you know things like that yes there are people who will be able through great uh, care to keep their poinsettia going year after year. Um, and I always hear from those people who say, Jane, you're wrong. And that's true. But for the vast majority of us, poinsettias are something we're going to, we're going to compost after a, a few weeks of enjoying them. Um, so it depends what you're looking for, but yeah, choose, mm-hmm. choose carefully, I would say, and try to get something that's going to last as long as you can indeed i had a question um from our uh, our house plant uh, member of staff at the, at the garden center christina she was i was having a chat with her as i was mentioning we were going to be chatting with you today and i just asked her what was the most popular question we get asked um you know day to day and the, the the most popular question is what is the best plant for a bathroom incredibly <laughs> <laughs> yes oh that's an interesting one yeah well is that kind of tricky because you know a lot of bathrooms are quite dark aren't they mm. um, especially modern bathrooms where the window's quite small and usually frosted which limits the amount of light coming in uh humidity is usually higher but the, that can kind of fluctuate bathrooms can sometimes either be unbearably hot or too cold so it's not the easiest place to keep plants and oftentimes the other question i get is bathrooms uh without any natural light what plants can I put in there? And so if you've got a tricky bathroom like that, whether it's got no light or just a small amount of light, I would say try to have a two or three, either the same plant or a different plant, sort of tough plant that you rotate in and out of your bathroom so that, you know, you can have a plant in there for a couple of months and then switch it out with another plant because no plant can survive forever with very low light but a lot of plants will be okay for a a couple of months with a a little um, period of lower light and poorer conditions and then you can move them somewhere better and they can kind of recover so you can do that 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 works really well some people have great success growing things in the bathroom Um, it depends what kind of look you're going for try to go for things that I would say you don't probably want to have massive pots of soil in your bathroom. Oftentimes, a lot of houseplants are what are called epiph- epiphytes, and that just means that they live on trees mainly. A plant that lives on another plant is basically an epiphyte. Not that it draws any resources from that plant, it just uses it as an anchor. So a lot of epiphytic plants have quite small root balls and therefore make quite good bathroom plants. The other thing that works really well is air plants, tillandsias, which they do have roots actually they usually sold without roots but they will grow roots but they don't need soil to sit in you can kind of have them you could have them hanging or you can have a a mesh with different tillandsias lodged onto it 
and they love the humidity of bathrooms and they're really easy to take care of they just need a soaking once in a while um and um this is one plant where you might want to actually miss them um and so lots of people like having calanzias in the bathroom but i would experiment and see what works and i'm always surprised people sort of say oh yes i've got a lovely load of cacti in my bathroom they're doing really well and i'm kind of like really <laughs> but you know if it works for you even if it's not the sort of chapter and verse of what you should do then then go for it yeah yeah most definitely yeah um again sort of uh, we, we've seen at the garden center a massive shift towards foliage house plants certainly in the last four or five years um at the expense, I suppose, of flowering types. Um, perhaps, why, why do you think that's happening, Jane? What is there? A, is there a reason in the in the scheme of things? Well, I mean, I do love. I'm a real fan of the Gesneriad family, which includes things like uh, Cape primroses and African violets and mm-hmm. lovely flowering plants. So I'm quite keen on flowers, but I think one of the reasons is that flowers are kind of seen as a bit old fashioned I think by younger people also I think Instagram plays a role here so mm-hmm. lots of younger houseplant growers are showing off their plants on Instagram and I don't know if you ever tried to photograph flowers for Instagram but they often don't come out as well as a beautifully patterned leaf does mm. and I think this is strangely a factor in that people lots of people are actually getting their inspiration about what house plants to buy from looking at social media and so they're seeing these gorgeous patterned leaves and that's what they're buying I think like everything in life there are trends I think that the wheel will turn and, and foliage uh, will um, possibly lose out a bit to flowers at some point you never know but I think my main thing would be grow what you like and make don't feel like you have to listen to what other people are telling you to grow because uh, there are there's a huge spectrum of plants out there and so many wonderful flowering plants that um, are beautiful to enjoy. Oh, most definitely, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, things like gardenias, stephanotis, um, you know, and then, and then we go into the, as you say, streptocarpus, amazing sort of colour ranges and, and actually good value plants too. But oh, well, you're talking about beautiful leaves and uh, some house plants, and I'm thinking here of the uh, the Monstera uh, duba, um, obviously are becoming quite expensive in the in the world of uh, the marketplace and uh, they're actually commanding quite extortionate prices, I've noticed, in garden centres and online. Do you think this is a trend we're going to be seeing more of? Well, yes. I mean, it's an interesting one. I'm, as I said before, I'm a thrifty person. I do not spend hundreds of pounds on houseplants. That just seems to be a bad idea to me. I have ended up really through chance with two very, very expensive houseplants, um, which are variegated uh, Monstera Deliciosa cultivar called the uh, Thai constellation <laughs> and um yeah i mean i've been i've taken cuttings of that plant and i've given it away to people because i just don't want that to be um that to be the dominating thing that we think about is mm. the price tag on these plants and you know it's 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 to some extent it's supply and demand you know these a lot of these plants the aroid family plants that you're talking mm. about monsters and dendrons that are in inverted commas rare were actually really popular in the 60s and 70s, went out of favour, and now there's not the same amount of mother plants available for propagation, and thus um, they've become in demand because people want to grow these plants. And there is a cachet to having the rare, you know, monster oblique or whatever. Um, I don't really buy into that, and I think that it's that's a worrying trend for me because it's, Sometimes you do get people who are actually obsessed and are spending money they don't have on plants that, to be honest, they could buy another species or cultivar for a tenth of the price, which would look just as beautiful, but they really want it because it costs a lot of money. So we've got to be aware of that as a as an issue. Um, and I think that, you know, fine, if you've got the money to spend on a plant, then that's absolutely fine the other thing that you get is that people will buy a plant for a lot of money and see it as an investment and chop mm. it up and sell mm. it on um without necessarily the expertise to do that properly um so it's a it is a worry it's a big yeah. worry at the moment mm. i think that probably we will see things evolve um and change and i hope that the, the sort of the wheel will turn i mean interestingly i'm a really big um fan of Hoyas and they seem to be going the same way as Aroid in terms of prices. And I'm very glad that I got most of my Hoyas a few years ago um, 
<laughs> because um, the, the prices have gone ridiculous. The other thing I always say to people is, you know, learn how to propagate properly because, I mean, this probably isn't the greatest message to tell to a garden centre, but actually I love swapping plants with people. Learn to propagate and you can enter this whole wonderful world of, of how plants swap and that way you learn a lot about your plants and you get the chance to meet new and interesting people and add to your collection at low cost. I mean, I say that um, people are always going to, I don't think it's going to do any damage to your business or any other houseplant business, people learning how to propagate, because it just makes them want even more plants, in my experience. Oh, definitely, yes. And there's nothing wrong with that uh, that message at all, as far as getting people to, to, I mean, it's also a better appreciation of the plant if you know how to, to uh, increase it too. On the, the subject of trends, obviously we've seen some those changes over the years. Back in the, what, the 1970s and early 80s, uh, I worked at a, a nursery, uh, Rochford House Plants, down in in Hertfordshire, and we we were selling yeah Monstera, you know Ficus robusta, the good old rubber plant, money plants, Crassula, flowering begonias, lots of African violets. We had I think two acres of African violets there, and things like Cineraria, which now I suppose people now know as uh, Sinetti, which obviously garden centres now have, have used as a as a spring late spring uh, sort of bedding plant. Um, today we have far more variety, Jane. But do you think uh, we're going to see any of these trends in resurgence in the of the old favourites in the future. That it's fascinating to hear that you work there. In fact, I'm just looking down. I've got I've got a book called Tom's Weeds, which is a sort of a biography of the Rochford um, houseplant exploits, which I'm just reading in research for my book. Mm. Um, and it's really fascinating to read about um, about the history of, of that particular nursery. And it, I mean, you're right. Uh, there are lots of plants that were growing then that really still haven't come back as particularly popular. I'm thinking of things like Scissors, Antarctica. That's still really quite hard to get mm. hold of, actually. Uh, the kangaroo vine, I Indeed. think, is yes. common name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Scissors are still... There are Scissors coming back, but not necessarily the ones we used to grow. Um, and, you know, there are other species that from the 70s and 80s that, again just haven't really broken through in terms of popularity. And it's kind of hard to put your finger on why. And yet things like the Swiss cheese plant and the rubber plant are just even more popular than they were then. And, you know, the, the snake plant, Santaveria, yeah. again, that's gone crazy in terms of popularity. So it's interesting. And you can't often put your finger on exactly why. No. No. <laughs> um, trends are fickle. Um, mm. But it's really fascinating to hear about Rochford and read about Rochford because, you know, I'm hoping that we're going to get a bit of a resurgence of what Rochford used to do mm -hmm. in that now that, you know, the dreaded B word, we've, we've, we've brexited. And although, of course, we're going to continue importing plants from the Dutch who are our masters, actually let's encourage our UK based growers. Um, and there's more and more of them popping up because actually, um, it's a great thing to be able to, to grow houseplants in this country and raise them ourselves. So, yeah, I'm hoping we're going to see more of that happening in the next few years. Indeed. And it's interesting, um, one plant which came into the garden centre a couple of weeks ago, uh, Medanilla Magnifica, uh, which is oh, a, yeah. a wonderful, wonderful houseplant. Again, Rochford's used to grow that, but they used to grow it in a very big way. Um, and, you know, it, it commanded quite a high price then, just like, I suppose, Phalaenopsis orchids did at the time, if, if they weren't really available. But now, of course, you can pick them up for, you know, under sort of £15. So it's it's interesting that, you know, the new plants which, which well, say new plants which are coming into the into the fore, hopefully will have a better price tag. So people will hopefully get hooked and will start to uh, embrace them. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I think, I think tissue culture is one of the reasons why we're seeing drops in prices of house plants. I mean, mm. orchids is a great mm. example that allow the mass production of these plants at a level where they can be sold very cheaply. And, you know, things, the prices do come down is the other thing to say. So philodendron pink princess, which was very, very expensive, is now coming through. I don't know if you've had any mm. yet, but it's coming through to sellers at a much, much more reasonable price range because it's, it's been prop mass propagated and so this very desirable plant is now coming within the reach of everyone, which is great. So mm. you know, that, that's really good. And it will happen with lots of plants that at the minute are very expensive. Once a tissue culture protocol has been worked out and, and production starts, it does happen. So, you know, if you do have a house plant that you're desperately seeking, but it's cost a fortune, I would say hang on because mm. it's 
probably going to drop in price in the next couple of years. Indeed, indeed. Um, you mentioned tissue culture and, and Venus flytraps. It's interesting. You won't find in Tom's Weeds any of this because it was, I think, obviously published later. But in uh, 1981, they opened their first tissue culture laboratory to create Venus flytraps for the mass market. So, um, yeah, Rochford's and were, were leaders at that, even that point, um, as a UK grower. And obviously that's been now superseded, as you say, by the Dutch. So we were innovators at the time. And obviously we've, uh, we've got a little bit, we've gone behind, which is, well, we've got, we've got a chance to uh, recoup that over the next few years, I'm, I'm sure. Indeed, yeah, let's hope so. Yeah. Okay, so ways of displaying and staging house plants have, have moved over the years as well. Um, and I've read, and in fact, I've not, not just read, I've actually seen that there's going to be a bit of resurgence in macrame. My word, that is taking us back to the 1980s. Um, what advice, Jane, would you give to, uh, you know, presenting indoor plants in the best possible way uh, in, in the home? It's really interesting. I think we've gone really far backwards in uh, the way we present houseplants compared to the past. Um, I mean, I've got quite a lot, uh, for research purposes and because I love them, I've got a lot of vintage houseplant books. And all of them are packed with really nice mixed planting displays of houseplants. And yet the number of times you see that really um, as a way of of displaying houseplants is really small. And, And usually it's, plants are planted individually um, and it can get quite messy when you've got lots of individual pots whereas actually there are so many different ways that you can combine house plants in an interesting way in in a single larger container and I really hope that people start to embrace that idea and experiment with it because you know we you really only need to look back at, at you know even the, the classic um, house plant expert by Dr David Hesse on mm. I mean you know, we probably look at that and think the pictures are a bit dated but actually the ideas in it are still fundamentally great and lots of other house plant books I just got hold of the Reader's Digest mm. house plant oh, books yes. from the 70s and there's some lovely displays in there so yeah think about combining plants choose plants that have similar needs pot them up together it helps with um, humidity and oftentimes looks really good and you can utilize containers that you wouldn't necessarily think of like salad bowls and uh, old copper pans or whatever you've got to hand to do Mm. that so you don't even need to necessarily pot them together in soil you can keep them in their individual pots but group them together um so that would be my thing i mean macrame i am not a great fan of hanging (laughs) cards because i don't really have time to take down dozens of plants and water them and fiddle about with them um i'm also don't like particularly like having things hanging from the ceiling because I just smack my head on them. <laughs> so I don't tend to go for that. But I would say go for whatever suits your aesthetic and mm. keeps your plants healthy, really. Yes, I agree. I have to say, I mean, I think uh, obviously we, we do some lovely displays at the garden centre here with obviously pot covers and things. But uh, people like IKEA, I mean, especially they seem to be obviously very obviously European and and quite out there with their the way they display their uh, their house plants, uh, albeit in in artificial light and in perhaps not the best growing conditions. But hey, that's how they do things. Um, yes, it's different ways to do different things, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah, there's there's endless opportunities to experiment. And I think I would encourage people to do that, you know, experiment and see what works. Um, And, you know, we all kill plants through not getting things exactly right. And that's absolutely fine. Experimentation will bring you interesting results, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Mm. So give things a try. And don't just think that you need to have um, an individual pot with an individual cash pot and that's the end of the story indeed indeed now the next question and in view of what you said a little bit earlier jade i don't know whether to ask it now um Go on. Uh, and as we're running up to christmas of course houseplants receive uh, another massive bo- boost from the ever festive poinsettia yeah okay yes I- <laughs> the, yeah, I was going to say they're deemed as tricky, fussy, and short-lived. Well, perhaps uh, in the the, the Perone household, maybe. Uh, would you give some advice on uh, on the poinsettia yeah. for, for this Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I don't like them. I like looking at them, pictures of them in situ in Mexico where they grow in the wild. Mm-hmm. They look amazing, but I'm not that keen on them as houseplants. You know, but millions and millions of these are sold. So you've got to try to get the best out of them if you're going to grow them. And to be fair, there are some really interesting um, new cultivars coming on now where you can buy ones with white bracts, 
because of course the 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 coloured bit is not actually a flower, it's a brack. So you can get white bracts, pink ones, orangey ones. I kind of like those kind of slightly out there ones. I think they're really interesting. So if you've got a poinsettia, the main thing to think about is, okay, they are not going to want to be sat next to your open fire slash heater roasting away at Christmas, which is what, you know, we want to be able to look at them. So we tend to put them in places where they're close to a sort of dry air mm -hmm. and they get finished off very quickly by that. They much prefer to be somewhere where the air is a bit moist and they're not subject to vast swings in temperature between day and night and not roasted. They they will lose their leaves if they're given too much water, but at the same time, you've got to keep them moist. So again, it's a tricky balance that you're trying to strike. Um, if you find that your plant is unhappy, <clears throat> then try to, try to move it, uh, try moving it somewhere else. I mean, uh, <laughs> I would say sometimes plants will do very nicely for about four weeks and they'll suddenly just lose all their leaves. Um, they will, they are, you know, you can, you can experiment, you can tr keep them and they will regrow leaves sometimes, but try to treat them well in the first place. And yeah, as I say, just don't blast them with heat, yeah. um, which tends to be, you know, all our heating goes up at Christmas when we're all sitting around at home, uh, you know, eating chocolates and mince pies. And the plant is just getting blasted with dry air. And unfortunately, that is also the cue for the one of my least favourite houseplant pests, the red spider mite. They just love that dry, stressed plant to mm. feed on. And, <laughs> and that's where it all starts going wrong. Indeed. So, yeah, I would say try to, if you want to have a good one over Christmas, don't buy it too early. Try to buy it, you know, a couple of weeks before so it's got time to acclimatise and then hopefully it'll last you through the festive season rather than looking miserable after sort of, you know, just just as you're coming to December the 25th. Yeah, no, good, 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 good advice. Um, so, Jane, I, I believe you're, you're writing a book. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about this? Yes, I am. Um, it is called Legends of the Leaf, and it's hopefully something a bit different than your average houseplant book. So... Normally, when you read a houseplant book, you might get a couple of paragraphs about the plant, maybe a reference to which continent it grows on. But this book is going much, much deeper on the background to the plant, a rounded profile of the plant, um, where it comes from, how it grows in the wild. And that helps you to grow the plant in your house if you know how it grows um, in its native home. And also how it's been used over the centuries in terms of medicine and culture and all of those kind of interesting things that you don't normally get to read. Mm. So I'm covering 25 iconic houseplants, uh, my choice. So I'm sorry if your favourite is not in there. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm covering sort of iconic things like the Swiss cheese plant and the snake plant and telling their stories, really. And also the, there will be care information in there as well with um, each species also has a lovely illustration by my illustrator, Helen Entwistle, as well. So it's going to hopefully be a beautiful book as well as an informative one. Oh, that sounds great. When, when can we expect to, to see that? Well, I'm still writing it. Okay. And I'm hoping it's going to be out next year. Perfect. Um, obviously, COVID has affected us all. But yeah, mm. fingers crossed for next year for publication. Um, and it's available for pre-order now. And, um, I've, you know, I've got to get, get cracking with mm. with uh, finishing the, the writing but the trouble is is that the more i research each plant the more interesting and fascinating stuff you find out and then you find yourself going down rabbit holes so that's <laughs> been um that's been very interesting oh. it sounds it sounds a great project so we look forward to, to to reading uh legends of the leaf um we always like to put our expert guests on the spot on dig it so it's that question if you're ever stranded on a desert island, which house plant house plants would you like to be stranded with, and why? Oh, that's a really good one. I think I mean I'm sort of wondering here whether it should be something edible, but I think actually I would be hoping there would be a nice sort of supply of delicious exotic fruit maybe already on the island. So I'm going to go for something that would just bring me joy, and I think probably it would have to be. I mean, I just can't see past, actually, my lovely uh, variegated Swiss cheese plant, which is would probably be quite a home and looks beautiful, 
and would remind me of, of home and would just be romping away and growing mm. absolutely massive and growing even more gorgeous, holy leaves. So that's probably what I would go for. That sounds like a good investment plan. So when you do get eventually, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you get the boat to... Then I could just sell it. Indeed, yes. <laughs> when somebody came to yeah, rescue me. Indeed, that would be a good one. That's that's, that's great choice, Jane. Um, also, we, we also like to uh, ask our guests for a, a, a related joke, in this case, obviously, houseplants, a related story or joke which you'd perhaps like to share with us. Oh, my gosh, I haven't prepared for this because I literally, my husband is Mr. Joke. I do not do jokes. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really going to struggle with this one. Don't worry. Um, I, think, I think what I would say is I can tell you, let me tell you a little strange story about um, Saxifraga solonifera, which might make you laugh. Um, it's not a joke, but it's a funny story. Um, researching the medicinal uses of this plant, mm-hmm. um, apparently that it is used for um, it is smoked and used as a treatment for her- hemorrhoids. Oh, right. so, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was the weirdest thing I found out about my plants. But you could, you could, if you've got a, a strawberry saxifrage um, right. at home, that you know, don't try this at home. But apparently. It's good for smoking uh, away your hemorrhoids. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Well, How there's... bizarre. I mean, who knew? Indeed. Well, we now know. Um, and we're probably not going to get that out, that fact out of our, our head for, for, for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jane. Jane, um, obviously, how, finally, how do our Digit listeners perhaps find out more about your podcast and, and perhaps your, your forthcoming book? Uh, it's all on my website, which is just janeperone.com, or you can just Google On The Ledge and you will find me quite easily. Jane, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you this morning for the podcast. Houseplants excite me, you know, from my, my apprenticeships at Rochford's to see how they've made a resurgence back in the uh, in, in the 20, you know, in, in 2021. We, we are really celebrating them in a big way. And uh, obviously your, your podcast over the last well, five years certainly is going to be a great way of infusing and connecting with our, our lovely potted plants on our windowsill. So thank you very much and thank you for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Well, that was a really good, interesting discussion about houseplants with Jane Perone there. Wasn't and, it? Yes. I uh, really enjoyed that. And uh, Peter, I suppose as we're chatting houseplants today, uh, what's your favourite? My favourite? Oh, that's an interesting one. I mean, there's so many lovely smelling houseplants mm. out there when they're in flower. I think jasmines and gardenias. But yeah, I, I think I'm going to go with the jasmine. And just, yeah, they're, they're nice plants. Equally, they can grow quite big. I know you often see them as houseplants where they're sort of wrapped up around those hoops. and Ooh, yes. <laughs> not restricted, but they're, they're, that's how they're grown, so they're kept nice and compact. Mm. But I know my mother had one in her conservatory, and we had it growing up trellis, and it got, mm. I'm going to say, 15-odd foot tall and was really quite an impressive young plant. Indeed, yeah. And I think that's the thing, is it when they're on those hoops? I mean, it's things like passion flowers. You say stephanotis is the other, is the other uh, yep. one which is that. It's always best, once the plant's finished flowering, to actually try and get it onto a, a proper... Uh, you know, climbing frame or some sort of maybe an obelisk or something where it can be more relaxed in its growth because I think those hoops are a little bit severe sometimes. That's a well. really good idea, yeah, because you can make quite a large plant out of it, but just yeah, you know, have have it on an obelisk and just grow it, wrap it round and round, and you know, keep it mm. growing that way. That's a really good idea. I like that. And what about your first ever house plant? Can you remember that, Chris? I, I can. Yeah, it's it's taking me back to my childhood, but I do remember. I think it was. A school project where we had to grow a pineapple top so oh, right yeah so i mean in the 1960s and 70s pineapples were quite an exotic fruit you know you yeah, buy yeah. in the supermarket um but I, I did manage to grow one i remember it was it was in the mid 70s probably 75 76 i'd just acquired a new new greenhouse and right. uh it was one of those sort of poly well it wasn't polycarbonate it was a, a, a pvc 
UPVC. Yeah, you know, UPVC. Yeah, they corrugated uh, plastic, which you often used to see on roofs. That yeah, type yeah. of material, but it was a very good greenhouse. It used to generate an awful lot of heat. Yeah, yeah, because they're slightly insulated, aren't mm. they? So they probably are really good at in, in, uh, keeping warm and keeping the warmth in. That's right. So it was it was a, a joint Christmas present, birthday present, if I remember rightly, and it was quite a big, big one, and it had like sort of a, um, barn door, so it had a so there's plenty of air circulation in okay. there. So I managed to to sort of root the top of this pineapple plant, and I potted it up, and it grew. And I think because we had such good summers, if I remember, 75, 76, uh, obviously famous 76 for the drought and the, the heat wave, this plant grew incredibly wide. I think it got about four or five foot across. Right. And it started to produce what I thought was a flower, which obviously turned out to be a fruit. But the fruit was minuscule. It was probably not this, probably the size of an acorn, to be honest oh. with you. It was really <laughs> disappointing. But the thing is that the plant itself um, just grew so grow very wide and the leaves were very serrated. And right. that really got me interested in bromeliads, which is another group of houseplants, which you often see at the garden centre now, things like... Uh, Ecomia, uh, which is that one with the wonderful pink uh, flower, that sort of have silver vase, yeah, and, yeah. And, and Varicia, splendors of the, the flaming sword, yeah. and obviously Gusmanias, and all those sort of things which we, we take for granted now. Obviously, they weren't popular at that time, uh, you know, in, in the, the scheme of things, and they got more popular. So, yeah, in a way, it was um, my first sort of baptism into, into houseplant growing. That's really interesting. And uh, just in case any of our listeners are interested in this, what do you do? You just sort of chop the top inch of the pineapple apple off and mm. stick it in a pot or yeah that's right any tricks you'd... yeah uh you would take so you would take take the yeah you cut it into the it's slightly into the fruit so you yep. probably about an inch of the fruit you'd remove the very lower parts of the leaves which are usually quite okay. small yeah expose those and then leave the um the pineapple um, not plant it straight away leave it sort of a day or so to sort of callous over right because it's quite obviously quite uh, wet and, and mushy yeah and then put it into a nice gritty compost i can't remember what compost i used when i was 15 16 but it okay. it was obviously um it was probably a, a multi-purpose type compost probably a john innes i suspect and uh, and I put a plastic bag over the top of it. I remember doing that. Okay, to keep the moisture in. Yeah, mm, yep. yeah, and turned it inside out every day, and that yep. got the humidity up. And I think within probably a month, six weeks, it had sort of rooted. But they don't, bromeliads don't produce lots of roots because they naturally are epiphytic. They grow on trees. These plants, right? Um, obviously, the pineapple plant probably wouldn't because of the weight. But a lot of the pi- the, the the bromeliad family. Um, a little bit like orchids, they don't yep. produce a lot of roots. So it never produced a vast root system anyway. Mm, that's really interesting. Well, maybe try that with Prayer and James at some Dude, point. Yeah. It, it sounds like a great yeah. fun perhaps, uh, Yeah, perhaps do it in the spring and summer, perhaps when the, the day lengths better and there's, there's more natural warmth, but uh, well worth a go. Yeah. Excellent. So, Peter, as well as your favourite plants, can you remember your, your very first uh, houseplant? My first houseplant? I... <sighs> I think, mm-hmm. I, I can remember as a child, I loved cactuses, mm-hmm. but I think the first one I started growing was a spider plant, because uh, my grandmother used to have spider plants. Mm-hmm. I can remember taking a cutting off that and growing it in a little pot, and that that was quite a fun little challenge. And yeah, I, I think, I'm going to say that was my first plant, whether yeah. it was or not, I no, <laughs> no, honestly no, remember. No. But no, it's good. It's a good, good plant, isn't it? And it, uh, yeah, producing those little runners, those little offshoots. Um, Definitely. An easy one to grow as well. Just keep it relatively moist mm. and off it yeah. grows, doesn't it? And it does. It, it's a very easy one. And we learned NASA's been doing some trials of house plants haven't mm. they and i mean it's back in the 90s they were very interested to see sort of what house plants what horrible things like benzenes and formaldehydes and things like that they're going to absorb and mm-hmm. they, they've come up with a really interesting list haven't they they have yeah i think it was um they, would, they conducted it in response to the um do you remember years ago this the sick building syndrome which we were always talking about wasn't it because yep. of the, the materials used in those sort of uh, builds and obviously that's sort of changed but yeah i mean the list they've come up with is, is pretty inclusive and certainly when you go to garden centers and nurseries you you often see uh, these particular pl- varieties of house plants species flagged up as uh, air purification plants and uh, yeah top of the list actually yeah is your, your spider plant so um and one i i particularly like is good the good old spathy film the the peace lily yep that's very useful for uh, for removing some uh, some nasties from our atmosphere 
And it's such an easy one to grow. I had mm. that as a student in Horticultural College, and I think I made reference to this before. I mm. used to just leave it in the room when, uh, over the holidays, and you'd come back, and the poor thing was absolutely on its last legs, all yep. wilted, and the compost had all shrunk in the pot, and yeah, it, <laughs> just, they were in the right state, and you just put a bit of water on them, and off they go again. They come back to life. They're such a resilient plant and such an easy one to grow. Yeah, and I think, Peter, the, the list the, the uh, NASA came up with are, are plants which are pretty reliable and certainly for the beginner or the novice uh, have to be up there. I mean, the only one which I do find quite interesting is the English ivy because I've, I, <laughs> ivy was very popular in the 1960s and 70s as, as houseplant growing, but actually in our nice warm atmospheres, it's quite a tricky one now. Mm, it likes a cooler temperature than mm. actually being inside, doesn't it? It's certainly not tropical, <laughs> that's for sure. And unfortunately for a lot of people, it's, it's, I think it's red spider mite, is the, is the little nasty which basically covers the plant with these little tiny cobwebs. And unfortunately, all the leaves tend to fall off quite quickly yeah. as well. So um, I, on that list, I would be, I'd be a little bit uh, hesitant about recommending English ivy unless you've got a very cool house or perhaps you've got a porch or a conservatory where you you haven't got an awful lot of heating absolutely That's a good idea mm. yeah subwestern it covered but is that the same for all of the ivies I mean you've got the lovely variegated ivies that sort of have the yellows and the mm. you know, ivory colors in them and uh, are they all cooler temperature sort of like and there's no tropical ivies that we could no no in, yeah i mean there's, <laughs> there's a few i uh, there's a few houseplants which have the name ivy attached to their name right uh, i'm thinking it was like devil's ivy the skin yeah, yeah. skin dapsis or the uh the pothas as it's sometimes called brilliant plant but of course not it is tropical so yeah if you go for those in your warmer rooms you're probably not far off and it gives you that trailing effect and that's of course what you want with an ivy isn't it yeah nice yeah, sort yeah. of surface coverage and mm. like you say trailing or you know, sort of something that would grow up uh, and, and yeah and a lot of people these days want um, i mean i over the weekend i put some new shells up in my conservatory and that's what i'm in the market for i need plants which tipple over trailing. to create that so suddenly you, you you know, you create a, a, a problem, but there's plants to fill that problem. Excellent. Yeah. Good stuff. I was just thinking about temperature there, Chris. Mm. I mean, the other thing that obviously a lot of us do is have the joy of having some herbs on the sort of kitchen windowsill. I know uh, chives and basil and things like mint, they're, mm. they're, they're very good for cooking, but sometimes they're, they're best kept in slightly different conditions than indoors, aren't they? They are, yeah. I mean, certainly, yeah, basil is a good case in point, isn't it? Because it is a, you know, even during the summer, we, we struggle sometimes to grow it outside in the warmth. So a really warm, you know, sunny, which is difficult in the winter, especially yeah. uh, in, in the month of December. Um, but yes, where, where warmth is, is required, and of course light levels are low anyway, but yes, certainly basil. But yes, if you're growing things like uh, mint, which of course will carry on growing indoors anyway, it won't die down. Yep. But again, cooler the better for those. So if you've got, yeah, your likes of your chives, even your, if you bring the pot of rosemary in, um, which you can do, or, or some sprigs of rosemary to keep going, absolutely fine. You just keep the temperature going probably around like the low 50s yeah would be fine around about 10 degrees should be okay. should be absolutely fine but yeah don't over over zest them and that's the thing a lot of people buy in the supermarket pots of of herbs put them yep. on the windowsill my advice is if when you're doing that when you get them home actually put them into some compost well that's something that i learned a little trick yeah you buy the nice cheap ones from the supermarket because for some reason they're an awful lot cheaper than the ones we sell at the garden center but yeah. like you say that i mean they're not grown in proper growing medium no. for long-term growth they're uh, grown just from seeds and to give a fast mm. sort of crop but yeah you can just take them out of that repot them into a slightly yeah. bigger pot with a bit of compost and suddenly you've got a nice rosemary plant to, uh, or uh, uh, some mint for a very cheap price and you get to mm. enjoy repotting it as well it's a yeah. good, good tip there Chris. yeah and i think also yeah because most of those are actually grown almost hydroponically aren't they they're almost yep. growing water so what you're doing basically you're converting that plant from a hydroponic plant to a, a soil a plant, plant which is fine and uh, for some plants i mean some, some of the mints and such like you'll have a, a plant there probably for life if you if you treat it well i yeah. remember you know nipping back taking small amounts of uh, leaves off yeah don't go too over the overboard especially when you've just repotted it let it give it time to put some nice strong roots out and then probably a month's time you should have something you know you know where, you know in a good uh, state of growth to to crop nicely for your for your sunday lunch perhaps 
So would it be worth, if you've got a greenhouse, maybe things like your rosemary and the plants that like the cooler temperatures, mm-hmm. to put them into the greenhouse in the winter? Yes, again, temperature-wise, if you can keep them obviously frost-free, so much the better. And if you're planning to uh, grow things like microgreens on the yep. sill, then then certainly. I think really, I mean, a, a kitchen window sill or even a you know a living room where you've got sort of a, a you know a more ambient temperature, you've got probably a better chance of of producing a crop of whatever you you know producing new leaves, new shoots. Um, but the, yeah, a good good stammer. If you've got the space in the greenhouse and if you're putting a little bit of heat in there, yeah, why not? Excellent. And we've got Christmas just around the corner now, Chris. You got all your presents sorted? Absolutely not, Peter. You you would expect more from me, but no, I'm not very organised. You're not the only one. Don't worry, Chris. I'm sure you and I. Well, I know I'm in the same boat. I've been trying to get my wife to give me some ideas. It's a nightmare, isn't it? Yes, it's so nice. I mean, some people are really good at always knowing exactly what to get people. I'm terrible at it, I, I must admit. And as I say, Peter, I never hear the subtle hints as well. They never come along. I mean, they need to be really sort of, you know, broadcast <laughs> or written or that, in an email. That's it. But, I mean, one idea that obviously mm. this podcast has brought up is mm. sort of all these books. That we obviously, we had Jane talking about her new book, the David Domley book mm. um, that has come out recently. And indeed. we've got two to give away, two signed copies to give away. We have indeed, yes. Um, more more uh, coming up about that uh, shortly, yes. Uh, but who, uh, what, what, what good houseplant books are there out there for people to think about buying if they want to give a nice present? Yeah, I mean, there's, there are some really good books out there. And of course, that, that market now place has really increased, hasn't it, over the last probably three or four years um when i was doing a bit of research for the podcast it, yeah there's probably 20 30 new gardening books on houseplants now okay um but having said that i mean the ones i um i particularly refer to are, are some of the old standard ones which of course have been around and some of them are now out of print sadly um jay mentioned tom's weeds which was the the story of the houseplant as, as far as a a producer of houseplants, Rochers, which is a really good read. Yep. And, of, and of course, you know, the houseplant expert from Dr. David Hassan. Yeah, yeah, because the expert series is a massive series mm. of books, wasn't it? I mean, there's a good, I'm going to say, dozen or so different types of expert book Ooh, out yes. there. Mm. Yeah, I think I think it came up to about 25, 26 in the end when they, they finished, because they did they went into sort of DIY experts. I mean, they moved yes, slightly it, it sort of, off off kilter, perhaps. Yeah. It went a bit off target, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, but they, they were good, but, well, they are good they are books, books still, yeah. and yeah. Um, uh, full of information. But you've got some more modern, sort of up-to-date ones now. Yeah, I mean, the, the one which I, I really enjoyed reading uh, is called The Potted History um, by Catherine Hallward. Um, how, house, okay. how house plants took over our homes. Wow! Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean it's very valid. I mean it, ha- it has been updated in the last year or so, so it is bringing it really up to date as far as the way we, we, we perceive house plants and a little bit about the story of how they actually came into the country. You know, through uh, plant hunters. Yep. You know, going back really when you know we used to uh, go across the ocean ways with our little Edwardian cases and <laughs> bring back yeah, little yeah. little cuttings and things. So a really good book if you want to know. You know the, the pithy beginnings of our houseplant world. It's a great book, and of course, it brings it right up to date with references to uh, obviously podcasting, right. uh, which is can't be any more up to date than that. Yeah, and obviously, so does uh, Jane get a mention in that? She book? does. She does indeed. There you yeah, go. yeah. So it's all very relevant. We're interviewing the stars here, aren't we, Chris? We are indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and also, it, it looks at how obviously social media, Instagram, Facebook yep. have also brought houseplants to our attention. So yeah, the potted history. How Houseplants Took Over Our Homes. Great read. Um, uh, priced, oh, I've got on the price there. Yes, yeah, so you're looking at um, 9 99 probably a little bit available, cheaper on, online. I was going to so, say, but, yeah, yeah. cheaper in the <laughs> online, but, but yeah. But well worth the read. I really, I've, I've read yep. it a couple of times now, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a good, good pithy book to get you, your head into. Excellent. And also you come out learning some incredible, interesting facts too. Yeah, yeah. And David Donnelly has very kindly given us a couple of signed copies of... Uh, uh, well, you and I have both yeah. looked through it, and it, I, I really liked it. I mean, it's a mm. easy book to understand. It's his fa- It's not every single houseplant nope. under the sun. It's his favourites, and there's some really good sort of information in there about the plants isn't there that's right and i like i like the title my houseplant changed my life Mm -hmm. which is very on key at the moment i mean it's all about sort of green well-being and uh, you know for the great indoors so it really good and i suspect this book was commissioned probably before the pandemic so 
it's quite insightful that we are now realising how important plants are in our general mental health and our well-being. And really, it just sits so comfortably with what's you know, happening at the moment. Yep. So for that, and of course, you know, David Dominic's obviously well known for his uh, his program in you know, Love Your Garden. Obviously, he's he's uh, this morning's. Um, horticulturist as well so he's well known on the tv screens and of course he's done a lot of work with thrive which was obviously yeah, one of our, our one charity of our, yeah a few years ago so a mental health charity so i, I think he, he knows the subject well and i love the fact that he's he's looked at it in a, a, you know he's looked at houseplants in a slightly different way yeah because there's some really interesting little pointers there in like for example when like, something's not looking 100 percent, and i mean jane picked up on the fact that Chlorine, you know, chloramine is mm. now in most tap waters so leaving your jar of water out for watering your house plants the next day no longer works because the chloramine hangs around whereas obviously chlorine used to evaporate so that's why we're best to use rainwater but in david's book he, he's pointed out that there's also fluoride in, right. uh, yeah. in the tap water as well which apparently some house plants don't like because Mm-hmm. They don't need their teeth strings. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's something uh, simple things like that that yep. until someone points them out to you, you don't always think of. And I, mm. I certainly do try and collect some rainwater. And you know, see, I haven't got a water butt, but I have got mm-hmm. various buckets and things outside. And I do water my house plants with that. And Good. you think, well, that, that's yep. a really simple yep. point. And uh, uh, from a mental health point of view, it's. I've been growing orchids for a few years now, and I think I've actually got the hang of you know, sort of watering them once a week when they need it, and learnt how to take care of them, which uh, for me is uh, quite a novelty. Um, and <laughs> yeah. I, I do love each year when you get that flower spike coming up. And like, oh, nice wow. feeling, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, and obviously you can also rate your care and how well you've looked after your plant by the number of flowers i mean if it only gives you a couple of flowers you think well maybe i should look after it a bit better but (laughs) when you get a good half a dozen seven or eight sort of flowers on the spike you think oh i must have done well this year and looked after it properly i I, I do find it very rewarding and it is yeah i mean mental health is obviously Mm. something that we need to be considerate of and simple things like taking care of house plants can help with that most definitely and i think that comes over in, in david's book very much so um i like the the format as well it's very dip in dip out and like we were saying before pc it's something if you're thinking about getting a new house plant you can really brush up your knowledge quite yep. quickly uh, you know yes you can use our smartphones for so many things but actually there's nothing like a you know a, you know a hardback book um and a bit of time you know a cup of coffee yeah definitely. and do a little bit of bit of perusing before um so i think for many ways and you know it's great for the beginning, but actually, you know, uh, I've read a few houseplant books, but I've learned so many new things from from his book as well. So that's even better that it, it built it, it works on so many levels. So so well done, David, for for creating a book which you know you know does exactly what it says on the cover. Yeah, and yeah. thank you so much for sending us the signed copies. I'm sure our listeners will enjoy the competition that we've got. And how do you enter the competition then, Chris? Oh, it could be any simpler, uh, Peter. So just go to our, our website, which is www.buckinghamgardencentre.co.uk and uh, follow, the, follow the links to the podcast. And there's a form on there that you just fill in. Correct. So that's just buckinghamgardencentre.co.uk and... Look for the form and off you go. And good luck. Brilliant. Nice one. The full terms and conditions can be found on the website. Yes, and I suppose uh, as we're at this time of the year, maybe a good opportunity to tell your friends about this, uh, this month's podcast and obviously to enter the competition. Definitely. Well, Chris, I guess... With Christmas approaching, we're running out of time for yeah. this year. Yeah, we're running out of year, aren't we? Yeah, what, 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 end of the po- year, um, end of the podcasting year. It's been a fantastic year. Thank you so much for all of your input on the podcast and all the points and uh, useful information that you've given us all. Oh, thank you. And thank you, uh, Peter, for your editing skills and getting us out on time, which yeah. is <laughs> <laughs> no easy no easy feat, but uh, at least we've, we've mastered the technology over the last sort of nine, ten months, Definitely. I think. Definitely, and I've had a real, really good, good time creating all of these episodes, so I hope our listeners have enjoyed listening to them, and as we always say, please tell your friends about us, and here's to 2022. Indeed, Peter, and in the meantime, a happy Christmas to all all our podcast listeners definitely happy christmas everyone today's show was brought to you by buckingham garden center and nurseries 
The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk.